Okay, just to say thank you again to Cedric Nunn for the screening of the documentary film, and also for his presentation and responding to the questions and prompts from the audience. We're going to move into the session uh, now by uh, Dr. Tembian Korsi Goniwe. I'm very pleased to be able to, to introduce Tembian Korsi. He's an artist and art historian lecturing at Rhodes University School of Fine Art. And he's also a visiting researcher at the Witt School of Arts. I think we can say a lot more about Tembian Korsi. I think he's got a, a very, very um, extensive uh, biography. Um, Last year, he completed his PhD at Cornell University. He's curated a number of very, very important shows. And I think that most of you in the audience will be very, very aware of the kind of work that he's been contributing for many, many years. So, Tembin Kosi, thanks very much for being with us this late afternoon, early evening. We're starting a bit late, so we're 10 minutes late. So, I think please do go on past uh, five o'clock and then we have a we have a full hour for discussion after that so we can uh, combine questions specifically on Tembi Tembian Corsi's presentation with uh, any discussion questions that anyone wants to pick up from earlier on in the day. Tembian Corsi, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you David. Is this on? I can't hear myself. Huh? I want to thank David uh, for inviting me here and also thank those who are part of the organizing. And it's always a collective endeavor, although one person tends to enjoy the credits. So David, I believe I'm acknowledging all those who are behind. Uh, when I was approached here, uh, I was asked to talk about Rock Street based on a project I did in 2013 and 2014. The project was titled Impressions of Rock's Drift, the Jumuna Collection. And that project came about thanks to <coughs> a gentleman by Craig Marcus here today, with whom I've worked in 2010 on a project space. And uh, invited me in 2012 to go to Durban and look at a collection by an Indian family, by the Jumunas. So when I got there, we look at prints, which I'm going to show some of them, which were collected around the 1960s, uh, 1970s, and early 1980s. And the prints range between 100 and something to 200, and they feature mainly about 18 to 20 artists who went to Rock Street. And uh, we spent quite a number of time looking at these prints. Some of them are already ruined because they were stored uh, in not so good condition and also they've traveled from South Africa to, to the UK and to America and then they had to come back. So the brief was asked to do was basically to put this print into an exhibition that would travel around. In 2013, the exhibition opened in Durban Art Gallery. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear you, this thing is just echoing. And then it came here in Johannesburg uh, at the uh, at Africa Museum in Newtown. And then it went to Grahamstown during the festival of 2014. And then it ended in Cape Town at Iziko, so the South African National Gallery. And we spent time uh, in trying to set with some of the prints, even the names, the titles, they were hard to identify. To identify. So it was quite an exercise. But one thing that came out, it was just the joy of looking at his prints. And it is this that I want to talk about, <coughs> about Rothschild, because I'm not an expert in Rothschild, although I've studied Rothschild, both as an artist and also as an art historian. And that exhibition gave me an opportunity to think about Rothschild. In thinking about Rothschild, uh, two things came. One was, when you read in most of the write-ups, even today listening to the discussion and the video, an incredible video by uh, Cedric, which I really appreciate, is that the discussion tends to put weight 
either on the historical coming into effect of Rock Strift and its production of these artists. And there's always this kind of uh, social, historical, and political emphasis on the institution, which is important. But what tends to be either written out or subjected to some marginal discourses is the actual artworks of these artists. Very seldom we get any theoretical depth in reading those visual objects. In other words, there's been a lack and absence of aesthetic ways in which we read those objects to discover, for example, what these artists, some of them are here, Patrick, uh, Charles, Vincent, what did they discover? What did they invent? What it is that they brought into the world of the visual economy? That we don't get. If you do, please, I stand for correction here. Instead, there's a constant recycling of ways in which this image are read, either within the popular discourse of the socio-political, which slides quickly to the question of the township art or the black art or so forth. And in so forth, that work falls outside of the broader context in which we want to think about art as an act of creating worlds or inventing universes. And these artists are denied that opportunity. That in most cases you do get with their, con their counterparts or contemporaries, in particular white artists. Whether when you talk about, for example, uh, uh, Walter Batis or Cecil Scottness, it is their invention that matter more than their biographical you know, <coughs> accounts or their struggles of what it means to become an artist. It is what they've brought into the world that becomes the key issue. And this is the case when we are reading also artists, whether Picasso or Matisse, very seldom we know how many their family. How was it difficult to move from Spain to France? Whereas when you listen to the stories, which are beautiful, of what it takes for these artists to go and study in that so-called remote area, there's a tendency to overemphasize that struggle at the expense of the actual thing that they kind of came out with. So in other words, their contribution is played down. This is what I want to call, this is that black archive I want us to, to, to mine or to excavate. Because it is in that archive that we are going to discover the creative intelligence of these artists. Whether we read those work in formal terms, that is to say, we think of their visual economies, the kind of visual properties that they either appropriated from other artists or from different movements, and they applied. And then they rearticulated in ways in which give them their own subjectivity or agency as artists in their own right. So it is that. So how do I want us to think about that? There are many ways. But I want to propose, for example, especially now with uh, the kind of revisionist project on the question of modernism, especially when it comes to non-European artists, and in particular in our country, black artists. How do we begin to think of the Rockstrift uh, artist in terms of what can become a question of their modernity on their modernism. Because if you pay attention in terms of the timing or <clears throat> the moment in which they were working, they were also parallel to other developments in other parts of the world. And some of those parts of the world have been now researched and discussed and written and written in what has become these global modernisms. So what will it take for us to begin to think of Rockstreet as a site in which and from which these artists produce their own block modernisms? That's one question I want us to think about because once we do that, in the same way when we read, for example, the, oh, the, 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 the written projects on, on, on whether European modernisms in terms of the different moments, whether we are reading cubism or you are reading serialism, you are reading impressionism, these are different moments and they take place at different times. And there are certain artists that are outstanding, but also the other artists that are written either on the margin or else are even excluded. So why can't we not begin also to think of Rockstiff as one of those sites, or as one of those moments? So then we can begin to read this work and see the characteristics which define them, not as a coherent body of work, but as work that speak to something that we can call, we can name it. And of course, that will also lead us because Rockstreet also comes, uh, came after Police Street, for example, that also produced 
a body of art, a body of works by artists that also has certain characteristics, whether you are reading the likes of uh, Cecil Scottness together with Sidney Kumalo, Ezra Mdukhai, already that work has a particular kind of uh, <coughs> traits which we can read, and some people are already reading it. And there was also at times when it, some of those artists were read under the term uh, Amadlozi, for example. So why we haven't come with concepts to begin also to name these artists, to give them an historical uh, <coughs> importance? So that, 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 that's one uh, thing I want us to think about. The second thing I want us also to think about is where are these artworks located or where do we find these histories? One comment, I think it was Nguli when she was um, commenting on the question of researchers and writers of these histories. And there's no secret about it. That has been a, mainly a, a practice of many white historians, you know, for reasons that we all know and we all agree, but we should not settle for. And the case is not different with Rock Drift. That is to say, for those who have a formal education or formal training, who acquire the skill to read and write, to research, and also have the possibility of resources to be able to conduct this research, they were able then to come out and become these historians or writers or theorists. When, for example, black artists in this country were not given the same kind of equal opportunities. So that consequence of these inequalities, you know, I mean, can, we cannot underestimate as to why these comments become important and why we cannot brush them aside. And they should not be read as complaints, as some tend to do, because they remind us of certain things that they have not changed. With that, I also want to go back. I like uh, Cedric's notion of utopia, although I want to take a different stand. I would prefer us to, to talk about dystopia, because it is there, I think, we can find answers. Because in utopia, with that, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a more of a given project. The beautiful thing of what's happening in South Africa, the crisis, is opening our eyes to see that things are not in place. The government is failing. And that, if we can read that as dystopia, I'm glad. And we can learn from uh, the strong work that is coming from the United States of America in terms of the Afro-pessimists who are not settling for any other things other than to press the problems, to begin to read what it means to be black in the world. Because once we begin to understand that, we are going to be able to understand that the question of rock drift is also part of what one can call, you know, a consequence of colonialism, apartheid, and other systems, including the missionary. And we should not also give credit to Bashar. We tend to give too much credit to the missionary, given the fact that, in fact, they were part of that civilizing, civilizing motion while they were distracting the cultures and the beliefs to the extent that most Africans, they are still in doubt of their own identities, of their own inheritances, thanks to the missionary. So if, if Rock's Drift as a school is a product of that, the missionary must account as well. Right? So what Adam's saying, I'm saying that <coughs> also because even the question of land, property, possession, how can missionary have access to land when Africans were dispossessed? So again, that takes you quickly to the project of colonialism itself. So you can't read missionaries as saviors while we're in partnership in different levels and in different arrangements. Right? Yes. What colonialism did, including apartheid, let's call them colonial apartheid, they created condition in an event where black people were dispossessed so that then once those are disempowered, then there's a rise of what we call it sympathy or empathy or charity, those who want to help. So in the event of some people are dispossessed, some wants to help, and that is part of the liberal project. Because I know you're disempowered, then I can help you. And then as I help you, I become a savior. I become this light. And when you do that, I listen to see also that we are a beneficiary and also perpetuate on that project one way or another. So I want us to read that project in that way. So once we do that, we begin to say, if education or training is part of a modern society in an event where South Africa was modernizing in terms of the industrialization, the urbanization, and other processes, so then, what then we have to talk about is that that moment is a colonial modernity. 
right? It cannot be any other thing. It cannot be a modernity in itself because South Africa is a structurally organized system based on colonialism and apartheid. Of course, both serving one beautiful persistent project, which is capitalism, right? So once we have those systems in place, then these artists, they have to suffer, including their communities. And then if Rockstreet now becomes like many other missionaries, Rockstreet is one, because remember whether you read the early educated uh, African intellectuals, they, they, they are beneficiaries of missionary schools. And most of them, I just want to attend to Cedric's beautiful points here. I don't think it's a question of isolation, it was a question of, of choice, a very calculated strategy of locating in the deep rural places. That is not an accident. As much as I appreciate those young who sacrifice living the better life in Europe to come here, but also you have to realize some of them were already hitting certain deadlocks. Some were bored. Some they didn't find any aspiration. Similar like, like Gogwan and other artists who thought when France didn't offer him nothing, he had to go to Tahiti. Because that's where he needed rejuvenation, innovation, to find new meaning in the modern world. So he went there to appropriate not only the paintings, uh, to paint those bodies of women, but also the techniques, the ways in which the Tahitians were, were producing their creative forms. And you can read this pattern similar in South Africa. So it is, it is in this kind of thinking I want us to think of, 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 of Rockstrift. Because those couples and others who came, teachers, they didn't only bring skills. In fact, they learned more than they brought something to this country. And that is always played down by these white historians. The emphasis is always on the teachers who themselves, if you read carefully in their interviews and their own uh, <coughs> treaties or writings, they do acknowledge that when they came, some of them, they didn't believe in the power of politics and art. But when they came to South Africa, that changed. But that is not emphasized, right? And also, if you read carefully in the evolution of that school, Rock's Drift, you'll find that two key people, one as a black woman that we don't see in that history, in terms of helping and translating, but also teaching. And also as, as, as a ram by himself, becoming that. But every time the narrative comes, it is about these two couples. And that's what it does for me. It sustains this white supremacy. So I want us to rethink that. I'm not discounting what <coughs> those early missionaries together with those uh, couples and also the teachers who came abroad came here. I'm not discounting, but we need to, to readjust our frame and our way in which we are engaging with them so that we can also start to pay attention to the agencies of these artists because without them, Rockstreet would never have the name today. What makes Rockstreet alive? It is the artworks. It is not those couples. Or is the Jumuna just runs off the images? So it, can you drop the light, please? So in a word, there's no rock strip, there's no rock strip without these artworks. So now we need to reverse that, to stop emphasizing the institution organization at the expense of these objects. When we read Impressionism, when we read uh, Fauvism, we don't read organization, we read artworks. Same thing when we read abstract expressionism in America, we are referring to particular names, Picasso, I'm sorry, Pollock, and so forth and so forth. So in other words, when we are beginning to think in terms of the modern, modernism. We are beginning now to prioritize the artist by prioritizing the artist. Pardon me, my slides uh, <clears throat> they are so bad. By prioritizing the artist, we are prioritizing. By prioritizing the artist, we are prioritizing the artworks. So this is what I was trying to say in that title, the subaltern agency. By, by subaltern, of course, I'm working with the Krabskian now. Uh, notion of subaltern. But I'm interested there as to when we are the subject who are marginalized or who are operating from the margin, you know, also we are very mindful of those even who are like us who are already part of the elitist setup. So in other words, for those like uh, what, what Sipo was encouraging of the university, we have to also be careful of investing too much into the university. Because we've learned that because they become part of the problem themselves, because they become elitists themselves. Once they become elitists, they become, they assume certain authority. And it is them now who become, what you call it? 
the stars. That's why today we keep on referring to the books by Elizabeth and Rankin and, 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 and Philippa Philip Hobbes, which is important, but that is always at the expense of these artists. So those are the authorities I'm talking about. And some of them, they have this university training. Some of them, they live, they work within this university. So we have to be cautious. Direct you, my friend, Sibon Dandu. So I don't believe much in, in, in academics. <laughs> of course, I'm one. <laughs> I have to fight against myself. Otherwise, I'm going to be part of the system, and I'll be the problem. So that's uh, basically one of the points I wanted to make here. Why the Tumuna has been important for me, because it led me to two other things which I want to present here. One, of course, is this collection that in the history of South Africa, we know that most artworks, both by black and white, are mainly collected by white institutions, whether from apartheid, even today even those government uh, institutions that have been inherited by the, the current uh, 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 led ANC government. Those initially were, 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 were the British and uh, the apartheid state. And then you get also contingents of private individuals or families who collect this work. And you'll find most of the black artworks in these vaults, in these white vaults. I call them white vaults. One rare case, and thanks to Sami to bring the exhibition at Johannesburg, uh, at the Standard Bank, is the one at Forte. Even again, that was initiated by the anthropologist, Diaga. And again, if you read carefully, and unfortunately Sami is here, I would have liked to say in the present, because even she, she prioritizes or privileges Diaga, both in the exhibition and also in the catalog. Whereas there are scholars who've been doing work there, one of whom is Gintwa, Nowhere is mentioned. So if you are going to read histories and rethink them, we need to pull, we need to go beyond the surface and retrieve these voices and people who did the work behind. That's what I was saying earlier. It was a joke, but at the same time I was serious. I said, David is standing here, but I know there are shadows. And those people are doing most of the work. So while we are going to thank him, but also be mindful that I would like also to thank Plaki and other people who are involved. So when we research this collection, it is to those people who need to pay attention. This is one of the things that, uh, when I was doing this collection, uh, helped me to, to ask, how come this Indian family collected this collection at a time of such a really, really dying times in South Africa? I don't have an answer to that. But my discovery was that, yeah, it was there's something interesting happening in, in, in the UK ZN, Natal then, especially around Devon. And there are narratives that are not spoken. And this collection offered me that. I just wanted to run so that you could see. So of course, Brad Charles is here. I'm sure you must be amused to see your own work. So I'll just run these slides and then move to my second point. And Vincent. I'll be short so that you have more questions, because uh, I'm sure you have, you have uh, noticed I'm just provoking more than offering much. This is a second uh, discovery in that collection. An Indian named Don Joseph, who in the 70s set up a black exposure. When you read about Rockstreet, you never come across his name. No one mentions him. And in fact, he's the one who has early contacts with those artists who went to Rockstreet. So much that he even exhibited them in Durban in the course of 70s until 1981. And why? Because it is not that he has no documentation. One of the things he did, he documented. And this is a very curious character. So 
So these are just the material the booklet he was producing. And uh, I'll, I'll also just show the, 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 the reviews as well and I'll wrap up. So these are the reviews. The first one was uh, 1973, the second one 1975, and then the last one 1981. And if you pay attention here, and I went to visit him yesterday, last year, I haven't seen him in 2013 and 14. And there he is. And remember the 70s also that period of the black consciousness movement. So it's not surprising that he has named it Black Exposure. For those who might not be aware, because uh, the black in the 70s was dominated by the black consciousness thinking that was inclusive of Indians, colors, and Africans. And it's interesting that uh, in one of the reviews where, for example, what Don does for his archive exactly performs Bigo. Because you remember Bigo rejected, you're not non-white. We are not an opposite of the white. So these are kind of narratives. They are there in these archives. So these are images of the exhibition. So I'll just run this. And also, there's one also beautiful incident uh, with, 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 John, or with, uh, with Joseph. You know, pistol pop out of a book. There is the book. This is a real story, and, John, uh, and Don was implicated. So he was a kind of an artist himself. There's the guy. And this also made me think of the Black Panther during the Civil Rights Movement. It was not enough just to be a creative. And for those who always believe in art as if art is going to change the world, I want to make them think differently. Art makes us think differently, but it doesn't change the world. It affects our perception. If we are not moved to action, nothing is going to change. So, yeah, just, I just wanted to show, like, to say this, these are written, these are in public, but it is interesting even when the likes of uh, Philippa and, and Elizabeth and many others, even from Deben, Julie Detroit, when they write, seldom they mention this guy if ever they do. There's the man, you know, you could see again that Afro, you know. That's what I brought for today, thank you. Tim and Kosi, thanks very much. Okay, once again, we have an opportunity to ask questions directly to Tim and Kosi. But uh, as I said earlier, if there are other questions that members of the audience would like to ask more broadly about uh, the program, what we've heard across the afternoon, what we've seen across the afternoon, then please use that opportunity as well. But I think let's start by uh, posing questions to Champion Corsi. Um, hello, my name is Oliver Mayhew. Um, uh, growing up, I have been influenced by artists like Walter Battis, and Fook Island has had a tremendous um, effect on me. And after today, um, I realized that the relationship between Kunstfuck and um, the, uh, the Rorke's Drift um, was prominent. And there might be a relationship between Fuck Island and Kunstfuck, uh, the name. So the relationship um, between these two um, and cultural appropriation I think both of us can agree that an artist like Pablo Picasso um, was more of a, a celebration 
of colonialism, whereas Walter Bat is also culturally appropriated um, from a culture he did not belong to. Though the way that he used these iconographies was um, to challenge a predominant narrative um, and to imagine something different. I think also a writer like Franz Fanon also um, played a big role in um, having that cultural exchange. So um, I'd like to ask you, like, what do you think about the, the idea that the emphasis should be on uh, the artists and, you know, not someone like the writers. Um, again, the writers play a big role in uh, broadening the conversation um, around these works. That's easy to answer while you're, you're moving. Oh, should I just go? Yeah. Hi, Tammy Crossy, Nolan, yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something from earlier on during Cedric's um, presentation. I think right at the beginning of it, we had a notion of Rourke's Strip being not seen, spoken of in terms of the past, but in terms of future narratives. And tying into what your presentation has brought up, how then would that kind of future narrative play itself out if the black voice or the black artistic voice has, has and is being stifled in such a systemic way, if that makes any sense. Let me just answer these two. The first one, I don't think is an either of a writer and an artist. My argument is simple here. In a case where particular artists are not given that uh, given attention, their work is not discussed, it's not theorized, not written. It is what I'm arguing for. It's not a question of these writers are not important. Artists need writers, writers need artists. Equally, artists need galleries, galleries need artists. The list goes and on. It's a, it's a network of systems and subjects and players. But my concern is with the specific artist, the group of the artists who went to Rockstrift. Those who've been written is because they have transgressed or traversed the domain which Rockstrift has become dominant with, that is printmaking. They have to work with other media. They have to adjust, like for example, uh, Oprah Petier. Seldom he makes prints, but he comes out of Rockstrift. There are other artists like Kea San, for example, who also move to, to reinvent themselves, to, to adjust to the changing world. And when the world of the 90s opened to South Africa in terms of the international curators, you will see their work traveling because of the shifts. So what I'm saying, if you're doing a historical work, we need to go and pay attention to the artist's work. Kiasan doesn't travel around because it's Kiasan, because of the work, the kind of work he produces, the installations, the performative, etc., that are speaking to the global shifts, whether those are, are folk or currency, whatever you call them. So what I'm saying is, when we read the Rockstriff artists, in particular of the 60s and 70s, we have to pay attention to what we're producing the effect or effect of their work, instead of talking about the experiences only. That's where the writers have, I, I have a problem with that. I don't know if I'm making sense. So to the second question is, <clears throat> yes, you know, somewhere as we're doing the project, I remember I was in Cape Town presenting, and I remember a student uh, misunderstood me, because I presented and say, one of the things what Rockdrift Rock 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 does for me is it makes me question the contemporary because what the contemporary does, it creates a false notion of advancing art as if it's not building on this so-called historical work. Whereas when you read carefully in some of the artists, you will see some traces of the Rockdrift artist in their own work, whether it's in Kendrick uh, uh, Prince, for example, you will see some traces that already were already articulated by these artists in the 60s and 70s. So in other words, the past is always in the present, and it is that that propels the future. So again, it's not an either. So when you're operating in the present, it's a way of swinging back and forth. Otherwise, it won't move.
Hi, my name is Isabel Rourke. Um, I'm an animation producer. And I produced an African folktale series, Af Africa's first 3D animated um, folktale series about you know, many years ago, and had to outsource that to India. And you know, from that experience, because of the shortage of uh, black animators and females in the industry at the time, it was 99% white male. And uh, you know, that experience really made me realize the impact of losing all of that experience, all of that money that went out of the country and also African stories not being done on the African continent. So started the process of doing internships, of training in my studio, young black and female um, animators. But the challenge I had to deal with at the time was that the only art directors who could influence the animation were white male. And so my art director, which I hired, was, art, uh, was uh, um, white male because it was also, it was a training process. And so that's where the knowledge base and the experience sat. And so when I looked at the artwork that came out of the films that we produced in that internship, you know, there was nothing really African about it other than the fact that we did a call out to writers across the country. And so the stories are African, South African, um, but the artistic aesthetic is influenced by the art director. So fast forward many years later, I've now kind of just launched this year an internship looking at um, Africanization of imagery and animation and doing an internship through Chimol uh, Hong, which is an arm of its university, um, just on the other side of the bridge. Um, and seeing the influence of these young kids and what has influenced the art and where they are and why we have to deal with issues of Africanization of imagery and animation because when I look at the films that are going out to the world, which Trigger Fisher producing, Sunrise Productions, all about animals, all looking Eurocentric, none of it looking African, other than the fact that it you know, was done on the continent. And so we're experimenting in this whole concept of Africanization of imagery and looking at how we have to re teach and how these young artists have to relearn because of the art that has influenced them. A big part of their influence is manga. So there's this big Afro manga style that's influencing a lot of the artists. And um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those challenges and one of the things that we're looking at is how do we start to help these young kids to reframe their thinking and their influences and influence the type of art that um, they're creating so that we can have an influence on the type of animation because for me animation is really powerful It talks to children, which means it's talking to future generations. It's also timeless It's it's shelf life is way longer than live action So you're talking to multiple generations with this work and it really becomes important who the art directors are and so the focus of my internship is around um, concept art and storyboarding, and I'm just niching in there because that influences so much of everything that we produce in the animation pipeline. The rest is just uh, the, the, the production, which is making of that, but it is the art directors that define that. So it really becomes key as to um, that question of what is influencing young artists and how are they expressing their Africanness in their art um, and when we have still a dominant of Western um, and also this Asian um, art that is influencing, it's having an impact on African children's representations of them, their culture, themselves. And how do we start to reverse that? How do we start to you know, fix that? And so I don't have, uh, so one of the other things I'd like to ask is if you could come and speak at our internship. <laughs> That, that was not a question, it was a comment. Uh, okay. Uh, one, uh, to speak specific of, of, of this, uh, the topic we are, we are about here is, uh, as I was saying earlier, without taking away the wonderful, great thing that the mission school did for Africans in terms of the education, the safety, and so forth, it was also that very moment where these biblical images began to un to, to, to write out and distort the kind of African imagery we are talking about or the kind of ways of being Africa in the world. And then you, can, you do get, you know, some of the images, uh, if you look carefully uh, 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 in, in most of the, the Rockstreet artists that 
not only work with the biblical, but they begin to rewrite it in their own ways, to use the biblical narrative to begin to think of their own conditions. But some, they begin to also to write, especially if you are as Rambada, the kind of series of work that you travel back reading the battles and, 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 and you know, <coughs> the encounter, the colonial encounter. But of course, you know, I mean, there's also limits because it would seem, and I stand for correction, that the kind of influence or the kind of direction those artists were, were working with, because the 60s, especially the 70s, it's so overwhelming with politics. So much that the reading of African narrative, even in education, was something that was outside of the education of the black child. Because what we were given, things that are other than us. So how to do that, I think, is to read beyond these so-called colonial and apartheid narratives. To take kids back, I'm not asking for a, a, a pre-colonial era, but to pay attention to, to those forms that manage to force themselves into moving through with times, whether through shaping. And, and, and Mecca Cabral puts it beautifully when he says, he said, um, returning to the source, by which he means we go back to those historical, to those cultural, to those ancient, but we retrieve them not in an archaic and static way, we find ways in which they became part of the, the contemporary. Because the young people will need to identify with the moment. Because now they are using selfies, they are using TVs, they are using computer. So you cannot ask them, you know, to worship skin, you know, when they are tight and stuff, right? They have to find ways in how they combine these traditional ways with the contemporary. That would be my one response. But I do think that that rests again, because they're beautiful written narratives, especially in indigenous languages. That's where some of these uh, kind of narratives are not preserved, are kept, you know, in storytelling. Because if you read novels, short stories, special kids' stories, you'll find beautiful tales about life, you know. Maybe Cedric, that's where it makes sense, the utopian life, the beauty, the abundance, the sharing, the idioms, and so forth. But in the field of visuality, that is, is the most and the worst distorted. Because it seems there's something about the visual, that it must be colonized to the extent that we must not see ourselves. Because the power of the visual shifts quickly compared to the written word. Because the visual, it has a, an immediacy. So the colonial regime seems, it started very carefully, quickly, to make sure that it's outside of sight. If it comes, we must always see ourselves model from other people's views. And that African story, those African narratives, is not only the content, it is the form, the way in which they're constructed. Because we understand the way things work or are, not because of what they are, the way in which they come about. So if we start to understand the formation, the constitution, and the construction, it is when you're you able to, dis to, dis uh, to, 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 to distract, to, to deconstruct it. Without understanding the way it works, we are doomed because we don't know what's happening. So in other words, we need to understand not only the images, the languages, but the way in which they work, the syntax, the grammar, the choices of, 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 of the way in which either the writers or, 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 or the artists, that's what I was trying to say. We need to pay attention to the way in which they create their images. That's where the form lies. lies. That's where the aesthetic. It is that I think we haven't done the work in. Thank you again. Uh, Sipo again. Uh, Temikos, thanks so much. But um, on your question of asking these very pertinent and incisive questions of transformation, you're speaking to what this country has gone through in terms of colonialism, apartheid, and now we're in uh, democracy. But now the disadvantages thereof is that the majority of the students at these tertiary institutions are Africans, but the teaching staff is, remains white. And then now to get to solve that problem of how do we speak to the students, as also my sister was saying, how the, the, the directors, so that people can begin to appreciate their 
themselves not to appreciate the other because we've always been conditioned and socialized to think whiteness is the supreme, is the best thing. <coughs> now, the question begins to say, how do we, the young scholars, and the, especially the emerging scholars, getting opportunities to get into these institutions so that they can begin to change this narrative? Because if you talk of teaching, mentoring, role modeling, it has got to do with the psychological effects that begins to uh, in, in, in manifest between the teacher and the taught. And then also, the cultural aspects thereof, because as you rightly put, the language, the making of images, the substance within the images, the language that the artist is, is articulating through the images, it's based on those symbols, this language, that, that cultural understanding and the background. So, in short, I would say, yes, let's begin the road to achieving that because we know our past and then we cannot dwell into it either. But what we need to do is to say, here is the dashboard and then these are the challenges and then how do we begin to resolve them without, yes, there is a beautiful thing about being a South African in the sense that we've got settlement colonization which brings certain benefits. But the balancing of all that is what we need to grapple with because the past has really damaged us to the point where it's very difficult for others. But what I just like what you did say in the Standard Bank Arena in terms of how Judas Matlangu uh, was appropriated but was never in brought into the Department of Education at DUT to be part of the staff, but they were able to appropriate his technique and then you know, and say, and leaving him out. Just the same thing as you talk of the currency of these artists in the South African uh, discourses. It's not there. It's only the researchers and the writers that people talk about. I just think it's thanks to, <laughs> I don't care whether you are academics or what, but institutions are there, and then you're beginning a nice discourse or challenge to begin to say, what can we do to solve our historical past as institutions of higher learning? I, I don't have an answer, Sipo, but I would like to think with you. You know, yes, as I was joking about um, the importance of high learning uh, institutions, also we must uh, thank the students in 2015 who brought that suspended project called uh, decolonization, you know, which again has been arrested now and been kind of stifled because it opened a debate that has been closed exactly to, 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 to bring into question the existing structures, values, models, curricular methodologies, theoretical concepts, etc., etc., including those who are authorities. But now that project has been arrested, and thanks to the very same democracy, which you seems to favor, because I don't think we should dwell in the past less. We should delve, in fact, deep, deeper. There's so much that the past awaits us, you know. Because one of the things we, we tend to, 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 to lose sight of is the fact that South Africa is not a structurally and systematically changed country, I'll explain. It is an extended kind of, uh, it's an extended system. Let's just take two regimes here. The apartheid, when they took over from the, 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 the English, they didn't change much. Instead, they added things that would work for them. They reinforced the question of sub subjugation of black and repressing black people at the same time elevating themselves. What the democracy did, it did the same process of selecting because the constitution that people appraise, it doesn't change. It drops few clauses and introduce other clauses that are still contested today. So we are operating on a very problematic structural setup. That's why things are not changing. Now the contestation is in courts because it is this constitution that is stifling things when it's very visible to everyone that nothing much has changed, 
Those who live in Soweto in 1970 are still living in Soweto. Those who are in Senton, they are still, but once you raise that thing, they call it the race question, but it's a social arrangement. So we cannot speak of past as if it's something that is not here to answer the brother. It is here and it's going to propel us to the future. Right? So why I'm saying that, even the question of land, there are statistics, it's not that these things are abstract. There's a research that's shown that so much percentage of whites, of Indians, of colors, we are at the bottom. The inverse. Thank you again to the missionary where they give us Bible. They took land. We praise. By the time we open where we are, we are outside. <laughs> right? So we cannot talk of a past in minor terms as a scholar. It is to read because once we get there, we bring facts how things became. So that's one. Right? So, and thanks to the ANC because it, the ANC began. It is the ANC that brought us here. So we cannot pretend to say the democracy. It is not a democracy. It is a liberal project. That doesn't work for me. Instead, now we are improvising in Fanon's name within it. And as I've said, you know, we've been to conferences. It is not the former privileged subject to achieve. It's us. We need to move out of Soweto to the city. They are not going the other way. If you remember, there was a beautiful ad was done of white people living a black life. It was banned quickly because that's why I said the power of image. They could not allow it. The world could not see the reverse. That's how white supremacy functions. It kills anything that can change the perception. So what I'm saying is, let's not minimize that to say let's do a little in the past. Because it is with us. Right? So that once we get that right, that's when we're beginning to ask the kind of curriculum is in place, who's teaching what, in how, in what ways. That's when then we're going to say, okay, this is what needs to be get rid of, this is what needs to be changed, this, right? Thanks God, there's already the scholar uh, areas such as indigenous studies that are beginning to research areas of herb, uh, medicine, traditional medicine, healing. You could see now the boom of Isangoma. Some are fakes, of course, some are beginning to work with professional, da 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 da. Things that have been there, but these things have been, have been reduced and undermined, while at the same time, some of the plants were planted, taken out into Europe, produced into medicine, and brought us back. What I'm saying is, we need to move away from that kind of setup where we are raw, aside. Things are extracted from us, developed somewhere else, brought back, and then we accept them. And that is not going to change unless we trace how and where it took place and who did it. So. And those are still with us. Some are among this room. Thank you very much, uh, Tim Gossi. You have, you have been very incisive and you've said it all. The, about the challenges that we're facing in this country and the, the liberal voice, the, the, and the voice of the liberals and the black apologists and uh, in using a certain language that uh, discourages those that have enough guts to question the status quo. You've mentioned, you've said a lot, and then I agree with everything you've said and you've been very incisive, but there's something that uh, wasn't touched that the missionaries or rather the, the people that started Rocks Drift, they said that one of the possibilities of establishing a Rocks Drift was to explore the possibilities or, of arts and craft as means of livelihood. Now, talking about livelihood is, uh, is more, I mean, putting it in, this, in, in a contemporary setup is that you mentioned that when they moved into those areas, I mean, there was a profession of land, okay? So the same people that had taken the land were again talking about means of, of training or developing black people for means of livelihood. Now, the language that has been used in writing the, about the black aesthetic has always been the, the language or the language of, for lack of a better way, of uh, gatekeepers or, or tastemakers who happen to be white, the publishers, art historians, 
the institutions. I mean, the fact that the institutions were sitting here talking about the pedagogies, and then you have people that you've mentioned, like Pat Mautra or the local citolas of this world, or I mean, let me use the one that are still alive, that have never ever been used by universities to impart knowledge, because teacher institutions are the one that pride itself as uh, the, the producers of knowledge. But do young artists understand the aesthetic that came out of Rock's Drift and how it impacted on South African black history? I mean, I'm saying this in the context that we've got two artist stories. I mean, no one ever mentioned the role of education that artists like uh, John Moll contributed into this country. And, but what I'm trying to understand more, all of this that we've just said, how it impacts till today, how the black aesthetic has been undervalued by the markets. Now, if you look at, you've said that, I mean, there's a lot of artists, I mean, that are in that show that has uh, been curated by Dr. Samuel Mizuli. That whose aesthetic have been appropriated a lot by white artists. And you always hear the Scottnesses, the Walter Bartises. I mean, it's the same repetition of, of European uh, uh, modernity, when they always talk about how Picasso was inspired by, 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 by African masks. But they'll never say to you that actually African aesthetic gave birth to the European modernism which is still problematic today. So yes, all of these things, it is important that when we speak or write about the black aesthetic, that is the only time that then the issue of the value, I mean, because at the end of the day, who decides about the price of black creativity? If the same universities never actually write about the aesthetic itself, instead they always write about as we're saying, the histories or the proximities of this artist in Rock's Drift, but how it impacted on the aesthetic and how that aesthetic that impacted on the pricing of the black aesthetic, or rather who controls it, who decides on the prices. So all of this goes again to look at what we're currently talking about, the issue of land, because we still, it's about livelihood. So if the aesthetic of black art is not written in a way that elevates it. Because right now, it is written in a manner that it's, it's in, a, in a very dumbing down kind of a way. And that impacts, of course, on, on the market. That's all I wanted to say. You have said a lot, Mokengelen. My take is the aesthetic first. Also, I should explain, I'm not speaking of aesthetic as that which is fixed in the domain of the image. I'm talking about aesthetics also in the way in which it's played out in the everyday. So when you talk about township as an experience, that's an everyday aesthetic to some people, the way they fashion themselves. To refer to that guy you call Foucault, right? He talks about self-styling. When he was dying, he read that book, the series of uh, something, history and sexuality. In the latest book, he talked about the taking care of the self. One of the concepts he used there is self-fashioning, self-styling. He was discussing ethics. I'm making reference to that is when you look at this work, they don't only reflect or mirror the experiences of these artists or where they come from. They are, in, they are inextricable to their experience. So the kind of aesthetics that is played out visually, it is also lived. So you must not separate that. That old uh, conventional European way of looking at art as it's standing there, I'm standing here. That, that has collapsed. So the way in which I enter the world, that's why I was saying, they invent worlds that are based on their experiences and what they've read and so forth. So in other words, when you talk about why, for example, in the visual arts, seldom you get artists not painting landscape. The beauty of landscape, especially currently, even in the 70s, is either are those artists who, 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 who who have, who have lived in the, in, the, in, the, in the rural, let's say, Bopeng, for example, right? Or, or even Mall. Remember the, the case with Mall when he painted landscape, he was discouraged. So in other words, the, the, the choices of subject matter and aesthetic, they have to do with your live experience. By being forced into these spaces that have beauty, why black people don't paint oceans? Because they don't have the, the luxury of enjoying the ocean. 
So that's an aesthetic way of living, of waking up, taking a, a walk, and breathing that's more, that beautiful salt in the morning. That affects your way of thinking, the way which you are going to translate when you paint. So by being dispossessed in those areas, you are being dispossessed also of a right to these particular human experiences. I just want to explain so that we don't see aesthetics as that which is a beautiful painting. It's an experience of the everyday lived. That's one. And that's exactly what we mean by the structural arrangement in which apartheid colonialism have managed to fix us. So it, I'm not surprised when I look at artists, for example, Soweto, Tube, Nyanga, they paint that because it's where they're confined. Their world is not opened. They live in lure of their vision, palms quickly, because they cannot travel. Imagination has been stifled. So that's an aesthetic way of living. Whereas you go to the suburb, the ceilings are high. That's not by accident. There's no room without a window, if two windows. That's a way of living. And that is, you know, if people say the art of living, that's what art is. It's not only that which we paint. I'm trying just to address that question of aesthetics. You know, you've raised a, a, a lot of things uh, when I'm again. Some, I'm sure some people will pick it up. One last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, in terms of the curriculum, the teaching, back to the comment I was making earlier about the, the universities. The problem is, even today, we have to blame the universities. Not the university as institution, the institution as individuals. Because the institution, the institution is not a building. People run those institutions, design those systems, maintain them, repair them. So we should stop, move away from the abstract. When you talk about gatekeepers, we must identify. Because it is once we start to point who's keeping what, we are able to address directly instead of skating around. As long he or she is hiding somewhere else, she won't or he, she, he won't. Right? So what I'm saying by that is once we do that, it's easy. Let's give it a case here. Why it took so long to have this kind of event here at Big Factory? When prepared or Prate were strong, prepared Hassan, why these artists were not involved in the teaching curriculum at Verts? It was a working to stand, they didn't need to transport from anywhere to bring students here to take artists there. Why? And at the time when some of the artists were even residents here. Right? So we cannot now make blame in abstract. We have to say there are certain kind of key individuals who are authorities in the field who've managed to perpetuate the system. So in other words, the losses we are getting of these artists, the histories that they are despairing with, the, the black archive I'm talking about is dying. It's a blame of this institution. That's why we cannot just appraise and look at forward and, 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 look at, and, and, and see the university as this model to do things. And that also, we must also name that even the transfer now of the white to the, uh, to the black, there's no guarantee. As my gang just have said, right? They are apologists. I prefer to call them body, black bodyguard of whites who are occupying these institutions, who are becoming also authorities, who are making sure that those blacks who are troubled, that who are troubling the system, they must be read as, oh, there he comes. He's going to say that thing. Even that thing is still there. So in other words, we are no longer dealing now with simple race, white, black thing. We are dealing with certain kind of figures in society. These institutions that are black and white, men and women straight and queer. So it's a very complex. I just want us to, to take note that. Because in some of the institutions, especially the fine arts, if you travel around, you'll see the composition in terms of demography has changed. Vert is one good model. Right? UCT is becoming one. Right? Slowly. You go to, 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 to Rhodes, where I am. You could start to see in the art history. So in other words, we cannot now simply always label or level things pointed wide simply. Also, we've become like services to that white regime. So that's why we have to be very careful. Uh, thank you so much, Timmy. I think mine is just a short question. Uh, in terms of how do we avoid binaries, you know, uh, the notion that there was the original Africa and that we must uh, search for. Um, yeah, how do we, maybe perhaps how does this research provoke new ways of asking questions. Um, I would like to think of Africa as a place of interconnectivity, is connected to other places. And African art, uh, in its pure form, 
it's also connected to the world itself. Uh, so, so that, you know, I think the idea of that you're searching for the original, it, it gets forfeited itself. Uh, I don't know, what is your response regarding that, that the, yeah, the original and... I, I don't believe in binaries, I prefer the dialectic. And also, I, 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 I'm not an original African because I'm already a mix of things, right? Because the Africa we are is so complex to the extent that even itself is constituted in Marx's term contradiction by contradiction. And those contradictions are productive because it is them, especially when we think them as dialectic. So I won't be interested in an authentic, but I'm interested in histories that have been demonized, marginalized, written out. Histories that matter, heritages that matter. So how we define them as authentic or original is a less of my interest. My interest is to travel back in time to say my forefather, my foremothers, and so forth and so forth, how they lived, what matters to them. And to arrive at that and travel back with it. Not to think of it, it was pure, it was original. Otherwise, it's going to lock me. I'll be doing a witch hunt. Hi, Tendengosi. Um, I wanted to find out, um, during the Standard Bank Art Gallery, um, Dr. Sami indicated that these works, um, a lot from Fort Hay, it was their first time entering the gallery. And then you spoke about transformation of times. What do you think of that? Because for me personally, I took offense to that statement in terms of entering a gallery. Is it really important or it's about acknowledging these artists exist? So, and then can you just give me an indication, you, going back to your own words in terms of how the system plays out and sometimes we become like the system. Um, uh, in terms of how the colon, uh, uh, colon uh, yeah, has <laughs> sorry, has uh, taken over, you know, in, in terms of you think you are transforming, but yet you are not. You are just playing out to the same system. So I don't know if you understand my question. I don't, cool as always. I always misunderstand people's question, but I'm going to offer my response, nonetheless. It's unfair, though, to pick up on Sami when she's absent here. That's why I also did this claim. I, I think what for me that exhibition meant or is doing, as I said beautifully and greatly, it went back in time, meaning that in time, which is uh, time as in Eastern Cape, in the Siskel, right, Alice, it brought works that belong to a particular time, but that are important, similar to the work I was showing, or similar to the project of Rockstrift. And that for me is the greatest thing. And like many exhibitions, or all exhibitions, they become site for dialogue and debate. They ask us to, 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 to begin to ask questions and find solutions to problems. And Sami has done her job, whether that job is greater or not, but for me it's greater. So now I cannot rest on, 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 on the trouble of the show other than what I can do with the show. Because it's there. Like any show, like any piece of writing, any, there's always a flaw, there's always a typo, there's always a problem, there's always a gap. Similar to the beautiful discussion with Cedric. He said himself before even people asked her that there are gaps, he could not do everything in the movie. And that's the limit of everything. So I think for me, if anything, I want to think about uh, Sami's show is just to build on those gaps and those limits by being reflective, critical, but also productive. Because when criticism just ends by pointing, pointing, it doesn't open up avenues. It doesn't make sense. So what now needs to be done in terms of the shift, if you ask me, of, of, of the demographics and a number of, of universities, for example, finance changing, is also to become to be more critical than where we were or we are. Because one of the things that, for me, if let's say we are 15 in a room and then there's five of us black people, if we don't begin to reflect on each other, we are going to be perpetuating the problem. So we need to develop ways of paying attention 
to our own selves as well as to those we think they are controlling. Because by the time we realize, some are co-opted, some have been put there. So if we haven't created that platform and that culture of criticality and also exchange, criticism is going to become something that is hostile, which is always the case for many people who are not practicing criticism. They see it as an attack, as a demonizing. But also it depends how it is structured. So we need to build a culture of criticism so that we are able to voice these things while the shift is happening. Before we settle, because once we settle, once we become comfortable, you know what happened. Look at what's happening in Parliament. People don't want to move in when they're not delivering. When even they don't have skills, they don't have qualification. Even when the research, the reports on them, they don't want to get out because they're comfortable, not only of the package, the style of life, and also they've believed in their own faults as the way in which things are. Don't underestimate that because ANC created a culture of non-criticality at some point. So what I'm saying is, that's one thing we need to begin to do, to nurture and create a space of criticism quickly. I'm not talking about dismissing, attacking, but a critical exchange. Seems it's not ending, I can't wait. What I'm going to suggest then is that we close the session and thank Tembian Korsi Guniwe very much for the presentation, but also for the manner in which you've responded to the questions and prompts. Um, and then I'm going to ask Malabone Mapuze. You haven't asked me to close. Sorry. My apologies, Tembian Korsi. No, I just want again to thank the audience, also to thank those who've been involved, including David, as well as the sponsors. Without money, these things won't happen. So I just want to thank Back Factory, the institution, the Swiss Embassy, and all of those, you know, for making it possible. Thank you.